So as I stand here before you at Wake Forest University, let me be clear. There we go. Medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the United States with over 250,000 deaths per year. And these mistakes that are made aren't mistakes that are made by the doctors. Some of these mistakes are made because the gold standards are off. And that's where we're going to go into the gold standards in healthcare are not always so golden. You see, healthcare is an old established industry, and this old established industry is very difficult to change and move. Different from software. When you look at software, you try a new innovative technology, worst thing you have to do is a hard reset. In the medical industry, you're dealing with the risk of human life. Now, as we go through this conversation and you start to see some of the different gold standards that are not so golden, we're gonna to touch on some different technologies that we're working on that is new in the healthcare space here in the United States including proteins and peptides, medical ozone, and then we're going to touch on the ultimate gold standard to look at. And as we talk about the ultimate gold standard to look at, I want to thank you, the tech community, because this is the progressive thoughts. These are the minds that help us push this, these different ideas forward. And now for my favorite part of the show, and by favorite, I mean about as fun as a paper cut, the legal disclaimer. <laughs> do not do anything I talk about or suggest without consulting your doctor, which is going to be interesting to say, because as we have this conversation, it might push you to do some research and go consult slash confront your doctor. <laughs> Having these different conversations with doctors, doctors are good people. They're doing the best with what they have. The issue is, is doctors have a significant more risk than in other industries. And what I mean by that is a doctor takes a new medical technology, gives it to the perfect patient. That said patient goes and walks out to traffic while text messaging. There's a risk that doctor can get sued for something they had nothing to do with. Now, me, myself, growing up, I was afflicted with several different health ailments. My mom, loving mom, did the best she could, took me to different specialists, and these, dif these different specialists made me sicker, which not just pushed me, it forced me into this industry of looking at new medical technology. I also do this for my mom. My mom has been through several debilitating hip surgeries as well as two bouts of polio in her youth. And as we go through this, you start to wonder where these different gold standards come from. The interesting thing about gold standards are some of them are just old. Coming up with new gold standards, you go through what's called the scientific method, which while rigorous, is still susceptible to human nature. And what I mean by that is there's still prejudice. But let's say the prejudice does not affect the experiment. It gets through the experiment. And the conversation we're gonna go into is where it can get hijacked by the board. During my youth and my undergrad, we proved something that was wrong, but it's still taught today. It's called the sliding filament theory. The sliding filament theory is how your muscles work. Now, I'm going to show you a magic trick, and by magic, I don't mean magic, I actually mean biomechanics. So those, for those of you who can do this, I want you to do this. If you have a shoulder issue, do not do this. Remember the legal disclaimer. Bring your right arm up, and as you bring your right arm up, I want you to face your palm facing straight up like this. Put your left arm left hand on your bicep and move your hand back and forth. What you're going to feel is your bicep both extends and contracts. In schools, it's still taught that the bicep only contracts. This is the sliding filament theory. Now, it's been disproven for decades, but it's still taught. Now, as you look at what we did 20 years ago, you start to think humans are still like primates in certain regards. And what I mean by that is you look at how gold standards are formed, how culture is formed, and there's a great experiment done with five gorillas, a set of stairs, and some bananas. And by the end of the experiment, the gorillas won't touch the bananas. And the best part, they don't know why. So as we move on past the legal disclaimer, we move into something that people get passionate about, chemistry versus calories. Now, calories is still king, and calories will probably remain king because there's nothing to replace calories with. One of the things I love about nutrition is people get very passionate about nutrition. They find something that works for them, paleo, keto, vegetarian. And then they think that that is now their new religion that everybody else should follow it. And as you're looking at that new religion that everybody else should follow, you've got to realize we're all different. And being all different, and because of the complexity of the chemistry of the human body with different DNA structures, different fingerprints, it makes it very difficult to replace calories. So calories gets to remain king. And as we talk about calories, one of my favorite stories about calories that disproves calories is having a conversation with one of my physician friends. And he was giggling thinking that women were foolish for saying they were gaining weight on birth control. I'm pretty sure women win the conversation on this one. You're dealing with the endocrine system. When you start dealing with chemicals in the endocrine system, you're going to see a change in the body composition regardless of the calories. Now, the whole concept of a calorie is based in thermodynamics, which just means fire. What that means is you take a donut, you throw it in a fire, and you see how much heat it puts off. That's it. You see in soft, soft drinks, 
where there's literally no calories in the soft drink, yet people still gain weight from it. Now we're gonna move on to the categories of sugars, fats, and proteins. Sugars, if you talk to most, institution, most institutions teach that all sugar is metabolized the same. Same with fats, same with proteins. Sugar's just a category. There are different sugars, sucrose, fructose, xylitol, urethritol. You look at sugars, sugar's been responsible, it has a responsibility in the creation of different yeast, yeast infections, while yeast infections are also treated with a sugar that comes from cranberries called demonase. You look at fats, fats, the skinny on fats is for some people, fat does actually make them skinny because fat's one of your primary building blocks of your endocrine system. And now we move into ultimate complexity, and by complexity we mean proteins. Proteins are beautiful and dangerous all at the same time. Proteins, the more I learn about proteins, the more I realize I don't know about proteins. Work with the PhD, she's got several PhDs just in the space of proteins. The more I learn from her, the more I realize I don't know about this topic. So within proteins, you've got hemoglobin, you've got insulin, you've got ricin. These are all proteins. Hemoglobin helps your oxygen carry throughout your system. You've got insulin, which controls your blood sugar levels. Then you've got ricin. For those of you who watch Breaking Bad, that's how he assassinated one of the characters in the show. Moving through onto something that everybody loves, and by what I mean by somebody everybody loves, people don't really love this, it's snake venom. Snake venom is a protein. It's actually made of proteins, peptides, and enzymes. Now when I say peptides, just think of them as proteins. It's a shorter chain of amino acids. For simplicity's sake, just think of proteins. So with snake venom, you can actually drink it. You just can't get it in your circulatory system. So with snake venom, which they actually drink it in the streets of different parts of Asia, mostly tourists that have drank too much alcohol. So with snake venom, what happens when you drink it, if there's an imperfection anywhere in the system and it gets inside the circulatory system, what happens is it fits inside a receptor site. Once it fits inside that receptor site, it acts like a lock and key mechanism and downs like a, downloads a software code to get the body to destroy the body. Now what we're working on in this space that's completely the same but different is using proteins and peptides to get the body, to heal the body. Our scientists used to head up a division for countermeasures and biological chemical warfare for Mother Russia. Not everybody loves Russia, but they've got some great technology. This is Cold War Russia. So as we look at Cold War Russia and their technology, she had a, headed up a division specifically in the immune space, which is in the probiotic space, which she's literally still 10 to 20 years ahead of what's being done here in the United States, primarily because if you were to talk about probiotics in the allopathic space 10 years ago, you'd be considered the village idiot. So as you move forward and you start to see what probiotics are doing, people are having this conversation about probiotics, it's all over the news. Her technology is specifically this. You take a strain, a very specific strain that costs billions and billions of rubles, rubles to develop, you lyse it, you take the cell fragments out, which are proteins and peptides, you take it into capsule form, it makes it through your stomach acids, and yes, things do make it through the stomach acids, and it downloads a software code to get your body to heal itself. It works specifically in the immune space. What we're seeing with it with anecdotal testimonials, not all the time always, but more often than not, that devastating flu that's knocking everybody out for one or two weeks, it's handling that within about 12 to 24 hours. It's kind of similar to you get a vaccine, and that vaccine gives your body the software code. That's through a shot. This is actually just through a capsule. We have 17 more strains that we're bringing through. It's a fun process. Going through more Cold War technology, we're gonna go into the hidden secrets of ozone. It's actually previous to the Cold War. It dates back to Nikola Tesla, and if you know who Nikola Tesla is, you're a geek and I love you for that. So medical ozone's over 100 years old. Why is it still a secret? Well, medical ozone's based more on physical chemistry than traditional chemistry, which makes it infinitely more complex. It's triatomic oxygen, and what that means is three atoms of oxygen versus O2. We're breathing O2 right now. When you hear about ozone on the news, they're talking about ozone mixed in with nitrogen. That's different. Medical ozone is O3, and what it's used for is anti-aging properties, which makes no sense because it's a reactive oxidative species, which is why most of the people in the allopathic space don't want to look at it. And what a reactive oxidative species is, it's a free radical. So free radicals are bad all the time always. Or are they? See, if we don't have any free radicals, we're an oxidative species, we die. The way you get rid of free radicals in your system is you take cyanide, and clearly don't take cyanide, look at the legal disclaimer, do not take cyanide, because it will stop all the oxidative reactions happening within your system, and when that happens, you're dead. Ozone, now it's actually not that much of a hidden secret anymore. It's just new to the allopathic medical community. It's now being used in orthopedics, dentistry, we have it in a capsule form to help with different GI issues. We have it in an orthopedic clinic, and let me emphasize, we're not the first to market with this. 
you start to learn throughout the years that the trailblazer going through the three cycles of truth, and I'll go through that in a second, is you end up with arrows in your back, and the three cycles of truth is this. First, it's ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed, and third, it's just accepted. So I'd rather just skip to the accepted part and skip all the others. So as you're going through this, clearly I get kind of geeked up about talking about this stuff and talking about medical ozone, always looking for new innovative technology. We get into the ultimate gold standard. There is literally a Grand Canyon chasm between medical technology that is now, right now, stuck at the university level, labs, or some scientist's garage, and getting it to market. Why do we want to get it to market? We want to get it to market so that everybody can use it. That's what it's used for. That's what it's there for. Now, there's a lot of controversy on how to do this. And I'm going to go with the least controversial thing, which is what's called the NIH grants, which is the National Institute of Health, which funds a lot of grants. Now, pre-1980, the government got to own all that technology, and it never got to go anywhere. After the 1980, they implemented what's called the Bay Dole Act, and with that act, it kind of freed it up, but they still left some, some language in there that allows a clawback mechanism for the government to take it back if they want to. And that was primarily because the taxpayers are funding this. Now, the issue with that is it increases risk, and whenever you increase risk, the market's not going to take that and go to market with it because an increased risk just, just adds another layer of what's going to happen because it takes a, a lot of time, energy, and effort to get this stuff to market. Quite simply, we take out those provisions and you're going to free up thousands and thousands of different medical technology and get that stuff to market. Second is what's called a health record bank. A health record bank is a pretty simple concept. It's been done in other countries. I'm from Arizona, so in Arizona it's hot. If I come here a month ago, it's freezing cold. I'm not used to ice. I slip on ice, I fall and hit my head on something. The EMT with a health record bank with all my data in one centralized location, that EMT can now pull up my data, start treating me right away, doesn't need to order new medical records. It makes everything a lot more efficient. On top of that, within the orthopedic clinics that I work with, surprisingly enough, over 40% of tests have to be reordered because the patient loses the test. So on that, you start to save a lot of money in healthcare. On the third part is the data, which is the most important part, the data. With the data, we can now go and regulate even better to see what chemicals are having counterindications counter out there on the market in the real world, because it can make it through the first, second, and third phase of the FDA and still come out and create an issue. All that said, the FDA has made more progress this last year than any time in history with more new medical technology coming to market. I get excited about this. The right to try has now, is now being brought into the United States, and what that means is people no longer have to go to a third world country with no regulation to go and try new innovative technology for a disease they're, that they're possibly dying for. So, in closing, clearly I get geeked up about this, I have so much love for all the doctors that are out there, for the professors, for everyone that's helping us bring this all together. Third, I want to thank everyone that put together the TED Talk, fourth, five, six, seventh, eight, nine, tenth. I want to thank everybody that's part of the TED community for being part of the community that comes together and helps us bring forward and take a big step forward. Thank you so much.